Esto es Colombia 4.0. Ya haces parte de la era de la inteligencia artificial. Ponte cómodo y disfruta de todo lo que hemos preparado para ti. Buenas, ¿qué tal? Mucho gusto, mi nombre es Jorge Fara. Bienvenidos a nuestra charla de hoy. Estoy muy emocionado por esta charla. Primero me presento rápidamente. Soy nativo de Barranquilla, Colombia. Vivo hace 18 años en Buenos Aires, Argentina, donde soy un productor audiovisual y editor de La La Lista, que es una página sobre arte y cultura independiente en Buenos Aires. Y hoy eh, me siento muy afortunado porque voy a hablar con dos personas que considero titanes de la creatividad. Son dos personas que son músicos, que fueron parte de una banda llamada Bent Knee, una banda muy, eh, muy interesante de música experimental, rock progresivo en Estados Unidos. También son youtubers, tienen canales en YouTube muy exitosos, eh, Ben Levin y ja eh, Justice Cow. Y la verdad que son de las personas más creativas, interesantes y únicas con las que he podido hablar. Es un gran honor para mí presentarlos hoy y poder charlar con ellos. Vamos a tener una charla, va a ser en inglés la charla. Si quieren escuchar la versión en español, pueden buscar los auriculares que están ahí para oír la traducción simultánea. Eh, y vamos a hablar unos 40 minutos más o menos y después vamos a abrir para preguntas al público. Así que pueden ir pensando en sus preguntas. Les recomiendo que lo aprovechen porque la verdad que es una... Gran oportunidad de hablar con dos personas que sus cerebros están en un nivel que yo no logro comprender yo, yo mismo. Así que, antes de comenzar, para mostrarles un poco de lo que hacen, tenemos un brevísimo video que es como una pequeña muestra de algunos clips de sus canales y después los presento en el escenario. Así que si ¿sí podemos poner el video, por favor, de Jessica y Ben. I'm alone at the party. We're all alone at the party. We're all staring and smiling like spit Cause we're home all alone when we party Orden una bienvenida a Jessica Kayan y Ben Levin. Hey guys. Bueno, empezamos la sección en inglés. How you guys feeling? Good. Are your microphones both on? There. There. Hello. Yay! <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. It's like I said, it's a big honor for me to be talking to you guys. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Um, we're talking about what it means to be a social media artist, but also what it means to create across various artistic disciplines. So before we get into all of that, 
I wanted to know a little bit about your journey. When did you decide that you wanted to get into the creative side of things? When did, you, when did music st start calling your name? When did filmmaking start calling your name? I'll go first? Okay. Um, I started being really interested in music um, pretty young. I remember writing out all the words to like the movie Grease soundtrack and um, just being like really in love with words and I've always drawn since I was a kid and um, I started getting more serious about music later in life like uh, in high school I got I was in bands and um, I was you know participating in all the school available music programs and yeah is that similar for you, Ben? Yeah, early on. I was lying to all of my friends. <laughs> I burnt a CD of an anime soundtrack, and I uh, brought it to school and told everyone that I had made the music, which I did not. And then uh, later on, I developed the skills to actually make the music. But I knew I wanted to be that person, and I, I just didn't have an identity of my own. So I was lying about this, like, vision I had for myself, uh, but I was a little guy. <laughs> you were manifesting. I was manifesting, <laughs> yeah. When was the first time you started working together? In tw 2009, yep. when we met. Yeah, uh, I, what was the first thing? Well, like, how did we start working? I mean, Jessica, we were going to Berkeley College of Music, which is too expensive, and Jessica had to drop out for a semester to get money. And we were applying for a scholarship, and we wrote a song together to help get a songwriting scholarship or yeah. something. And that yeah. was our first collab, <laughs> yeah. I think. Yeah. And then Bent Knee came along, right? You started your band. Yep. yep. We started Bent Knee, uh, my, our friend Courtney Swain and I, and then Jessica joined shortly after we started. And we toured for about 11 years, mm -hmm. uh, and we made like five albums in that band, and or six, and then... <laughs> And then we left the band recently, and yeah. the pandemic changed a lot of things for us. Right. So at some point in the process, you decide, let's take this to a visual medium, right? At some point in the process, you decide, I want to make videos as well as music. Um, what led to that decision, um, and do you remember when you started doing it and how it felt at the start? Yeah, we... We were uh, in the band that we were in, Bent Knee. We tried to collaborate with a lot of people to make music videos and it kept not working out. And so eventually we started learning how you do it ourselves. And we started making uh, music videos and then also YouTube videos. And I feel like for me, some like, watercolor painting and turned into digital art, turned into animation. But for you using 3D art, it was pretty different. Yeah. Yeah, it always seemed like all of a sudden, if you wanted anyone to hear your music, they'd have to see it first because social media and the internet is really a visual medium first and foremost. And sound, a lot of sound gets missed even if you have music on while you're scrolling or engaging with the internet, it, it just doesn't quite sink in. And so it seemed important to always have videos when we made music, which is funny because we were focusing so hard on music, but it just never seemed possible to reach an artist on our music alone. And this was like in 2011 already. And now it's probably even more true than ever. Um, that having some ability to make a compelling statement in visuals is, is actually necessary, and for better or for worse, you know, to bring people into your sound world. So do you think it's fundamentally easier maybe to convince somebody to check out a music video than it is to send them a link to a song? Yes. And do you experience that yourselves as consumers of music and art? Yes, definitely. Well, why do you think that is? I, I think we're just visual creatures first and I think we all like appreciate music and 
Um, music does something to us that visual media doesn't do, but there's something about our, our moment of technology where we're at, where kind of just relaxing and sitting with your thoughts or listening to music is a little bit more uncommon it's now. It's difficult. Yeah. It takes, I think, effort to just listen. Even yeah. if you love music, it's hard to um, carve the space for it sometimes. But we find ourselves naturally on these platforms. So when you make art to fit the platform, it's always got some visual element. And it's more likely to show up organically in people's lives if it starts with that. Of course. I also think that um, it's for uh, when you make the music and you make the, the visual media, you can add to the story, which is something that I didn't really know before I started doing that. You can like expand your vision rather than it being like a hindrance on just, I'm a musician only, this is so hard. You know? Yeah, actually, that's a really important point that we actually like doing the visuals. I know some people don't really want to do it. They just want to make their music, and that's how I felt. But it is a very compelling form of communication, so like, luckily it, we've found a lot of love for it. Yeah. Do you find that your, your, your brain, your creative brain, works differently when you're composing music versus when you're tackling an audiovisual project? I think like when I'm actually working, it's a little bit different, but I think the feeling beforehand is the same, which for me is like, I don't want to do it. Um, I'm like a big procrastinator, and um, yeah, I feel like that's just me. <laughs> but well, but so how do you deal, if you're a procrastinator, how, how can you deal with that? How can you exist as an artist and put out content constantly? I have learned some things that really help, like, um, doing short experiments, like for 30 days, I'm going to do this very specific thing. And right now I'm doing a project that is 26 weeks and takes every letter of the alphabet. And uh, I'm making a video for each one and releasing it once, you know, every week. For a was arcade. arcade. Yeah. So you, you, yeah. you went to the arcade and made a song about the arcade. Yes. And B was? Beach. C. C was cemetery. And D? D was doggy hang. Yeah, and then it's so fun. On. It goes on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and this kind of thing, having some structure where there's, like, accountability, even if it's, like, I made the accountability possible by being like, I'm doing this um, publicly has really helped me stick to it. So, so it's, it sounds like it's less about not procrastinating and more like understanding how you work and working around that, that impulse, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it seems like some of us, I mean, all of us have our distinct way that we think and the way we work. And a lot of effort is put into um, forcing the way we are into like a set structure. Like I have ADHD and there's a lot of pressure to like chill out in school. It's like chill out, just like sit down and be normal. Um, but I found that in, in art and maybe in lots of other ways, uh, it's more about creating a system that is complementary to your quirks and to the if you're a procrastinator not about how do I stop procrastinating but how do I make it so that procrastinating isn't harmful so like we were talking earlier about this and you mentioned like having a tight deadline can be very helpful or like having more pressure can be helpful if you're a procrastinator um, and the procrastination itself doesn't always hurt the work it's more I think about tuning your your expectations and your process to suit your like attention and the way that your attention flows. For me personally, if I am going to be mixing audio, I need to do it in 15 minute increments and then I take a break. I can't mix for 30, 40 minutes, but if I'm working on animation for some reason, I can do that for about an hour at a time 
And if I'm writing songs, I'm about half an hour at a time. Uh, and I'm just trying to figure out like the right chunks for me. So what role does fun play into what you do and, and, the, and your ability to do it constantly and, and uh, dependably? Is that a, dr a big driver for you, like having fun doing it? I think it's, it's like, I probably wouldn't use the word fun, um, because when I think of fun, I think of like carnival rides or something. That's just like a really intense experience, <laughs> yeah. And I think it's more like soul feeding. Um, and I also know that when I don't do it, I like don't do well. So it's it's more it's also like managing the like the bad feelings by just continuing so to work. Let's stay with that for a second. What happens in you when you don't do it? What do you what do you feel? Oh, uh, like a pile of bags. <laughs> I feel like a need to get something out there in the world? I feel like, I think it, it can be linked to self-esteem, where if it's been a long time since I've made something, it's a weird like process. I don't know why it works this way, but almost every time I go to make something, I have to re-remember how to make things. And I can look back and be like, I've made so many things. Why am I like doubting myself? But it's like, it's different every time. And yeah. Yeah. I, well, I think part of the, the doubt comes from this sense that what we make uh, will get missed. Because mm -hmm. there's, and that's, that's part of it, but yeah. there, there's so much um, media and music and video and art coming out all the time. And we see it someone could have spent six months making something and then they put a little trailer on Instagram and we watch the trailer for like half a second and we move on and you just know this feeling that um, the art might just totally be missed and I think the, f the fun is important um, my word for it, I think soul feeding is really good too where it's like you have to make sure that whatever you do, even if most people don't see it or interact with it, when you look back at the collection and the large body of work you've made, that you feel good about what you made. That you feel like you were making honest work, that you were making work that matters to you. And so, yeah, I think like when you're about to start, there's this weird fork in the road. On the one hand, it's what do I think will get people's attention? And then there's what do I who am I right now? And like, what do I actually really want to do? And I think if you focus on that soul feeding or that fun aspect, the fork kind of shrinks and it becomes clear like where to go. Yeah. Well, I'm guessing that there's also something that plays a part in it as well, which is your, your platform, your main platform is YouTube. YouTube is a, a tricky, place to ex exist in as an artist. Um, let's talk about actually putting up your work online when you have something that you're very proud of, that you're very happy with, and you put it out in the world. What's the best and the worst part of that process? Uh, so I was really thinking about this. Um, I released an album in September, and I it, the album uh, is called My Dad Died, and it was all about my dad dying and it was very cathartic very like real and hard stuff in general and i didn't want that experience of like have like having all of this all of myself like in this work and putting it out and it feeling missed so i ahead of time thought of doing like a a walk in a park with friends while we listened to it and like a bunch of friends came and we had this like really beautiful this silent walk around this pond and like a listening party exactly yeah it's that. the sense of connection there because I was yeah. at the party <laughs> and the sense of connection with the people listening it feels the impact and the value and the, the beauty of the music is felt much more real than 
looking at view counts or play counts. Now everybody's getting their Spotify end of the year numbers and the artists, we're seeing our life in these numbers and they're either so big that you want to make sure you do it right next year so they stay big or they're so small that you feel that you're underappreciated or that your work um, is just like lost. But that listening party, there were only like nine or ten people there. That listening, the deep, mindful listening to the album and that connection, I felt really like really proud of you and um, and like the album really, the 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 it got the listening it deserved. Um, so it's not about quantity of people; it's really about connection. Yeah. So that's like your main priority that you look for and sort of the fact that it exists also on YouTube is almost secondary, right? Yeah. yeah. It yeah. has to be. So like I have been doing YouTube since 2010 and I've put out more than 600 videos and there was a period of time where I was doing a video every week and each video would take from 60 to 100 hours to make and I was giving all of my everything to it and saying no to everything else. And I was seeing my income increase and my fans increase and the numbers, the numbers were going up. And the result of that was a huge crash in my capability to continue eventually. I ran out of gas. Um, and the whole time, while everything was now looking back, the, the peak of my career so far, it never felt like anything. It always felt small. It always felt like I was missing and missing and missing. But I loved the videos. So the numbers never brought me satisfaction. I got my 100,000 YouTube subscriber silver plaque, and I left it at my parents' house. I didn't even look at it. I felt that I didn't earn it even. I felt that my famous friend Adam Neely, I just mo leached off of him somehow. I just didn't even give myself that credit because the numbers, they will uh, create the monster mirror image of your art and it will always be there like whenever you reflect and you can't see what it really is. Um, so I recommend to anyone who's making art and wants to post it online to also take time to do what Jessica did, which is show it to somebody in person. And not just anybody, but somebody you think will, will appreciate it. And even just a couple nice, like, oh, I like that part, experiences, that really can fill the, the hole. Yeah. So uh, the, the subtitle of this conversation is how to stay sane while creating and sharing your work online. That sounds like a big key to how to stay sane, to, to, to yeah. give another life to your work rather than just the view count that you see on YouTube. Yes. What other techniques or what other tips and tricks do you have for people who are artists, who are sharing their work online, who are trying to get people to check it out, for them to stay uh, motivated and sane? Uh, one thing that I do, um, it's a little controversial, but I will just post and then leave the platform. Just not, not scroll other people's, not see what happens. Just get out of there. And I feel like that can really help keep my mind okay and not be like, what next? Oh, what did they say? And, and like, oh, but I, what is this friend doing? You know, the endless scroll. Yeah. I recommend uh, finding a way to make your art fast. Um, this is also a little bit weird, maybe. It sounds weird. I believe that quantity in art is more important than quality for you. In other words, the act of repeatedly over and over and over again starting something small and finishing it results in an in improvement at dealing with the impact of your art either doing well or not well from a view standpoint. And the, the, you, you do this over and over again. You create and you learn by repeating and repeating. And then as you feel yourself improving, 
you gain motivation. And the motivation from knowing you're improving at the craft results in you actually being able to make deeper, more quality-oriented stuff more often. And then that can become a source of passion. And once you have passion, it's so easy to start. But it's very hard to start without passion. It's very hard to start when you feel uh, drained. And so I think making more stuff should be the priority. So making stuff quickly is important for that sanity. And the AI tools, you know, uh, since this conference is a lot about AI, it's a really broad subject. And it's really referring in the arts to machine learning specifically. And it's got all kinds of implications. But when it comes to you as an individual being able to create work faster, that is, a, I think, an important benefit that we need to at least like look at. There's a whole lot of other stuff to maybe be like, uh-uh. But these tools that make things happen faster, I think, will are helpful for that um, quantity to quality to motivation to passion cycle. Um. Yeah, I also think um, like learning an art in like a new medium can be really, really helpful in remembering what it's like to be a beginner again and like how fast you improve and like just the kinds of ideas you have. I feel like every time I've like been like, I don't know, something's pulling me towards this. I don't really know. And I start messing around, it turns into like a whole like limb of mine. And it's been like really rewarding and it keeps like giving back to like the music part of me. And uh, for example, mm -hmm. Jessica, um, one day, after she had finished her album, the new one, um, she was like, I need to make a music video. I want to make a music video. I'm just going to go to a carnival and start filming. And uh, I thought that was interesting. I mean, I always try to be encouraging and be like, yeah, go do the thing you think you want to do. But I didn't really think too much of it. Just like, all right, I'm going to go film at a carnival. All right, cool. No plan. And then she goes there. And she discovers a format just in like being there and experimenting. And she has this format for the videos for the album, which is she lip syncs um, in different locations and different uh, like cool cinematographical shapes and compositions, with but without hearing the music. So there's it's not perfectly on all the time, and she has to stretch the timing and do all these editing things that create a really interesting visual story and it's also so intimate and she made a format just by I'm gonna go to the carnival and try things I think that's a good mantra for any artist is um, take first steps take those first actions you have no idea like what's gonna happen and also try not to be too addicted to having a vision yeah you know? <laughs> I I think even more than like fun in the beginning is like excitement and fear together. <laughs> I feel like whenever I'm feeling both of those, I'm like, this is good. <laughs> it sounds like fear. And um, last night, yesterday, uh, Fred Mascherino uh, did a conference just across the, the other uh, auditorium over there. And he talked about how fear and art are always tied together and how fear is not something you should try to fight, try to shy away from. It sounds like it's something that you guys embrace. Um, same with what you just mentioned, Ben, like trying something you've never tried before and embracing the imperfection as something that gives character to your work. Can you talk a little bit about those things, fears and imperfection and the role they play in the art you make? Yeah, I think the biggest fear is often like a, a self-fear of worthiness, like Am I singing in tune enough? Is my, like, I don't know how to make a video. Why should, why could I make a video? My video won't be good. Or like, um, I don't, I'm not good at mixing. Or I'm not, there's always these like limits we placed on ourselves. This logic line that's like, I am not good at this. Therefore, I should not do it. 
And I think the thing to embrace is your curiosity to even consider doing it in the first place. And so a better line of thought is, I'm not good at this, should I even do it? And it's like, the next step is like, what person possibly has the right to tell me not to? Would I tell my friend not to? Should I tell my friends not to? And you start questioning like that voice that's trying to tell you not to. And you realize that that is not your voice. That's the voice of the people you don't like, the people who've shamed you or the people who have made you feel small. And it's living there in your head now. So we have to actively fight that voice so that we don't become that person who discourages others. And the first way to not be the person discouraging others is to learn to not discourage yourself. Because I've learned, and so has Jessica, I know, from so many weird experiments and learning to sing. I was not good at singing, and I got good. And like learning to do these things from nothing, you, you really realize that like the more you're saying, yes, go, 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 uh, the more like you discover that you could never have imagined was possible. Yeah. What is something that you're still struggling with as a social media artist, to, to use that term? What's something that you're still feeling like you're trying to improve on? Comparing myself to others. It's, if you imagine putting all your work in an art museum, and instead of your name and a description next to the art, it's just, it's price. That's the world we're in. The, the view count, the like count, the comment count, those are the price. That's the subconscious value that anyone who looks at something, you can't help but notice it. If I have more Instagram followers than average or whatever, there is a certain um, acceptance of my work that comes from that. And it's incredibly dangerous to live in a world where the first thing people think of when they think of your art is its worth, it, or its value it, from a numbers standpoint. You're, um, you're, you're just going to be addicted to making those numbers go up. And it's hard, like, I go in and out of caring about that. Uh, yeah. Is it the same for you, Jessica? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think, like, for me, also struggles just like, I think like most people now, like I struggle not just going down like a YouTube hole or an Instagram scroll forever or watching Netflix until my eyes roll out of my head. <laughs> and um, I think it's really, it's like a conflict of interest because it's like I want to make things that make these places better and more like lovely for people to be in to then scroll forever. And I feel like it's, part of me is like, that's not my problem. Like I should, like we're all part of this ecosystem, but like I definitely think about it. And um, yeah, I feel like if, if like I was transported to like the 1980s or something, I would make more art maybe, <laughs> you know, like there's just less to like capture your attention and like less like studies about like these things get you to stick around on these platforms and, you know, light up these parts of your brain. That's, it is a dark realization when you realize that the better your work is, the more people will be hooked on the platform. and. If you're talking some creepy AI stuff, the scariest AI has existed for a long time, and it's the algorithms of the social media platforms that curate what you see and what ads you see. Like, I like generating a cool image of a sky in the style of whatever, but like, and that's cute, and I know there's a lot of implications to that, but holy crap, the TikTok algorithm, the Instagram algorithm, that has actively already, like Twitter has poisoned, there are people you can see before and after going on Twitter and they're like poisoned and sick from it. Uh, and that's scary stuff. 
and knowing that when I, if I make an awesome tweet or something, that just helps people have a reason to stay there. When I started doing TikTok, a lot of my friends who had not started looking at TikTok started looking at TikTok to see my TikToks. I don't know what to say about that, but you can definitely think yourself into a hole because you know what they say, there's no ethical consumption, blah, 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 but like, <laughs> we gotta do something. We gotta do something, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, um, we're gonna move on to Q&A now from the audience, but before we do that, I wanna ask you, uh, as, as creators of, of content, um, you're also consumers of content, and I was wondering what you see and whether you currently find inspiration, joy. Do you see a positive outlook for like the artistic out landscape that, that's up and coming right now that you guys have found, that you guys have come across? I mean, I feel like just sometimes you'll see a gem that will make you feel a lot and just like it's it is like the thing where you you see it and you're like oh my gosh I'm like changed from this I want to show everyone this and then like your brain thinks that's what that like platform does is like brings you the most inspirational things um, and that's hard but um, I really I follow like I really like um, like Elizabeth Gilbert, the writer, and um, like psychologists, and I, I, I feel like if I spread around like all of my interests in social media, it becomes like a little bit less like this is what people are doing in music, and like these are the trends to follow, and these are like how you get everyone's attention to your album. Like I feel like when you have like different influences it comes off more organic, I think. I also yeah. feel that the wide variety of things that we can like helps us become a little bit more similar in the good ways to everyone else. Like, I have hope that there will be less ageism between generations because we can maybe appreciate more shared uh, memes and like humor. I, I don't know if this is actually happening. I do feel like the distance between millennials and Gen Z is not that big. Uh, and I mean, I don't know how boomers to Gen X feels, but boomers to millennial feels like a very big gap. They were our parents, you know, so that's a whole different relationship. But I imagine when Gen Alpha is entering like the they're creating stuff and we're becoming fans of them. Like the fact is like, I could never like be a fan of like a high school student's art before now. Like, it, it, like if, if some anonymous account that happens to be run by a 56 year old or a 12 year old is making cool art and I don't know anything else about them. Like I think that does some good that there's a voice there's an artistic voice for people where it's not segregated as much necessarily. Yeah. Or the way it's segregated is by interest more than by access. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also excited about the fact that um, it's way easier to make a living. Uh, or not even, I don't think it's easier to make a living. It's easier to make some money from art now oh, yeah. and supplement your life. The, because there was no such thing as making some money before, I think. I think it was like, you're in or you're out. Uh, but I don't know if that's really true. It just, it's, there's a lot of potential, but I don't know what is, is real and what is like the, a, like a facade. Right, and we're head, still know. figuring it out. <laughs> exactly. And hopefully we do. Yeah. So thank you so much for chatting with us today. Uh, okay. We're opening up preguntas para Ben y Jessica. Um, ¿Tenemos un micrófono para el público, por favor? Un momentito. Thanks for being here and for listening, everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Yeah. It's a big trip. We're happy I had to be here. The best breakfast of my life. Desayuno uno. Yeah. Ben, and was really, ben and Jessica were really happy about the fruit of Colombia. Yeah. 
Sí, cuéntanos. Uh, can I ask in English? Sure. Um, I believe I'm looking more for a personal advice. I'm a musician myself, and uh, my relationship with social media is a little not good, uh, especially because I'm more used to like playing in performance, live performance, being on a stage like the one you're at now. And I've been finding like new job opportunities that require me to do music for people in other countries, and I found that as interesting. But I found myself as someone that doesn't really understand or doesn't know how to like social media. Like it is a thing that you know that you need it, but you don't quite learn how to like it. And I guess my question is, did you guys learn to love it or is it just a thing that you just feel like you need it? I love that question. Um, I think what you're wondering about is so important because if you jump into this environment of checking out social media a lot, there are many forces within it that are trying to manipul manipulate you to buy things yeah. or change your worldview. It's not really a safe environment, and I hope it improves over time. I think it could. Um, so it's smart to come at it with a strategy. Yeah. And so what I would recommend is creating some ground rules, some tenets that you follow. That maybe it's very simple, like one rule, two rules. If content makes me feel this way, I block it. And if it makes me feel this way, I keep it. So block it if it takes too much of your time. Block mm -hmm. it if it doesn't motivate you to action mm -hmm. in your art. Keep it if it gives you ideas that you can work with to make something new. Keep it if, even if nobody is watching the videos you make or whatever you end up making, you're still glad to have the record of it, the collection. Because for me, like, I love to look through my past and like remember, you know? At the core, like Instagram, you can think, I like to take photos and make videos so I can remember my life. Like that is a good reason to be on there. A bad reason to be on there is no reason, right? When there's no reason, worst reason to be on there, right? So I think making some ground rules and think, If I spent eight hours a week making something and nobody saw it, would I have benefited from the making of it? So if that means recording jams with your friends, if that means interviewing musicians you know, if that means having a, like an online diary of sorts of just improvisations that you do in the morning and then you reflect a little bit about how the day is going, you know, whatever. If it's something that you actually find is like a healthy, meaningful part of your life to do, then it's cool to do it a lot. Right. Otherwise, it's not good. <laughs> yeah. so. And I, I also think you can like be like a cool artist on social media without engaging uh, like and being like a fan of social media. Like I think you might have some original takes, original like way of like shooting a video or like just different inspiration than social media, which can get pretty homogenized and like can go like everyone is following this trend and it, like the first time you see it, you're like, okay, that's kind of cool. And then the second time you're like, oh wait, I've seen this before. And then the third time you're like, this is not very cool anymore. And I think um, if you're not, In, a, in that sea at all, if you're just over on land, you're gonna have a really different take. Um, and that's really interesting for people, I think. I yeah. thought of one last thing that I think <laughs> is useful for everybody. Yeah. You can think of yourself as two people, the artist and the reporter. So the artist does whatever the artist wants, and the reporter's job is to tell people. So in your life, you're the artist, and on social media, you're the reporter. The reporter never tells the artist what to do. The artist just shows the reporter what to tell people about, you know. So that way you can keep a line where it's, the addiction is like, oh, I made a video of me playing surf rock guitar in front of a red background and that got a hundred more likes than all my other videos. Maybe I should make another surf rock video and another and another and another. That's uh, usually not good for your health. So instead, you let the artist do its thing, and the reporter just tells what, what you're doing. 
Very cool. ¿Tenemos otra pregunta? Está más cerca el micrófono. Ok. Hey. Hi. Um, I, I want to know how, how is your perspective in the quality of the music in the future? How do you see it? Because if everyone can do music, how do you know what is the, the quality? How, how we can protect about uh, uh, Dutch, um, garbage music? <laughs> well, uh, personally, I think that um, if you like something, if, you, if it just feels right, then you shouldn't uh, worry about like if, other, if it's truly great or not. Um, because I, I think with like songs and, and music in general, it, it hits you very honestly. You hear something and you like it, it just, it's before like words and it's before um, so much. It, it's just a, a gut feeling that we get when we like something and you should trust that but there will be a lot of things that you'll you'll hear a lot more music or see a lot more like a flood of art coming in and it is hard to filter so one thing I like to do is I, I still value music critics I like Anthony Fantano and NPR and these different pitchfork these different publications that help to curate albums and artists, I find that still to be very useful. So at the end of the year, when they're making these best albums of the year lists, a lot of the artists I like, even though it's a nor very normal way to find artists, I found it's magic. Like a lot of great stuff it ends up in those lists. Um, so that's a good filter. So it's like, if something, if you like something, just trust it, that's cool. And if you're looking for a filter, I like it, uh, actual music critics, like people more than um, curated playlists, generally, yeah. Tenemos otra pregunta? Yeah, uh, so I'm a graphic designer and um, I'm like thinking that I have to be in the social media um, to show my work and to show my talent. And there's a lot of uh, creatives and artists in this world. But I have like this um, discussion with myself to how to be like these original artists with, I, I can't uh, say like a creative block, but a creative overwhelming because of the social media. So how to manage this, like when you are in creative block and you go to the social media on these um, many videos in, on TikTok, on Instagram, and say, okay, I can do this, I can do that, but how do you manage to be yourself, to true to yourself, uh, but unified it with the uh, social media trends or something like that? Good yeah. question. Yeah, really good question. Um, I think that like a lot of times the block or overwhelm comes, it, it's like best friends with comparison. Like when you're like, wow, that's really cool. I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if my work is like that. And I feel like when you bring that into the making, you just, you keep stopping yourself because when you start, the thing is like a baby and it doesn't know what it is yet. And if it doesn't seem like it's going to be the right adult thing, um, you just like, nope, cancel. And then you're like, I'll start another, and that's not working. And you like stop yourself before you get very far. And I think for me, what can really help is like a, some kind of like paring down of like maybe what you're looking at for a day or a week of not looking at social media to make something or um, just like sometimes I do like a restriction where I'm like, I'm, I'm going to get some water and some snacks and I'm not going to leave my room until I 
have like gotten to this place with this piece or whatever. And just like a restriction on yourself. Um, and it's like, I think that, again, if the, the social media thing is inspiring you and you feel like, I want to learn how to do that, it's helpful. If it's making you feel bad about yourself, it's not helpful and just maybe cut it out. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't feel like social media is a good fit to you, just remember that we all collectively do make it what it is. So even if you have an idea that doesn't seem like it'll necessarily work on social media or it's not a good fit, you should still put it there and maybe like not worry too much about optimization for the platform yeah. um, because it's surprising what changes. YouTube videos got really polished and fast. <laughs> cut, 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 cut. And everyone starts having the best lighting, the best cameras. And now there's a bit of a move in a direction where people want a little more like calm, relaxing videos, videos that are a little more modest in their um, like lighting and editing, be more intimate. And it just goes back and forth and back and forth. So it won't, the trend won't always fit you, but you following your own like interests will sometimes intersect with the trend and it's hard to I, personally I try to like figure out what do people like to see on this platform what do I like to see what do I want to make and see if there's any connection but if that's stressful or like weird you just do your thing because you never know yeah, yeah. I'd also uh, I'm sorry I'd also like to recommend because your question seems to be about re retaining your authenticity um, and you know, in light of uh, the algorithm and social media, we do have a panel about that today at 3 p.m. either here or over there um, with Laura Burhan, who's a great musician and uh, music video producer. Um, so if you want to check it out, you're invited. It's all about how to retain your authenticity in the light of uh, you know the overwhelming nature of the internet and such. I think we may have time for for two more questions. Is that right? Can we do two more? All right. Let's do one and two. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to ask in two different ways. The first way is as a boy who wants to start like this this mm, this life in in social media and survive uh, and wants to survive. So the first question is what is the recommendation or what is the like the um, the numbers that you need to reach? to see if you are like doing well in social media or not. I mean, if there are two months after you create your videos and you constantly work on it, how do you know if there is like a future in this for you or not if you want to monetize and live from that kind of work? And the other question is, if if I am a, a social media um, um, uh, a creator in a social media and I want to, to work just with advertisement and some kind of uh, industries want to contact me to offer uh, different advertisements to different people, what is the, the ways or what, uh, do you, uh, what you want to tell us about all this topic? Mm -hmm. And w maybe, if, maybe it's a little bit like... Uh, Disrupted the, the disrupting this question, but if you want to tell us about numbers, about like industries or something like that in your area, that should be awesome. Thank sure. you. Sure. Yeah. So I would say look at the comments that you get on your work. If people are, it doesn't matter how many comments. It's like, what are the comments like? If the people commenting on your work feel strongly about it. That means you're communicating it well. The odds are you have so much light and brilliance in you, and the real question is how to show it in these very limited, strange, new environments. So if the comments, even if it's like three, are like, wow, I'm really glad you're here doing this, that's, that's a good sign to keep going. The view counts are very deceiving. 
um, basically what you want to, if you're thinking of making a career with this, with sp specifically on social media, what you want to look at is your views quarterly. So f look back three months at a time. Don't look video by video because one video could be 100, the next is 500, next is 30, two, a thousand, what the hell? And it makes you go crazy. Mm -hmm. So you look back three months and you notice, am I trending in any particular way? And you just think about it, but really those comments are where it's at. And um, you can take a couple paths to monetize from there. If the people are few but passionate, then a Patreon will help a lot. If they're many but they don't care about you, it won't do you any good. If you go on TikTok, you get a million followers, but all they care about is your like memes, but they don't want to know anything more about you as a creator. You've just made TikTok cooler. You've just made them love TikTok more. But that's not going to be a career. So I recommend YouTube. But on YouTube, it's, it, there is like a more of a path because when the people start to really care about your work on YouTube, they're more likely to be interested in your Patreon and your other offerings. Then as far as advertisers go, um, I don't do it very much, but what I understand is you want to build a relationship with companies that you actually like because the first most important relationship is you and your audience. It's about a dialogue between you and them. And if the advertiser gets in the way, it's not a good long-term move. Instead, you want to, if you're going to promote a product, it should be something relevant to you, to you. Like, not even necessarily to your channel. It just has to be something you really like. And you try to build a partnership with them where maybe at first they don't give you very much money, but they're, they're like rooting for you. And you, you grow with them. An example of this is Anthony Fantano from The Needle Drop and his, like, the wallet company, I think Ridge Wallets. It's just been the same wallets. He's been talking about these little pocket-sized wallets for maybe, like, five, six years. Uh, that's wild. I, I mean, he's grown so much. They must have grown with him. That's very cool. And it's not that different from any other career. It's all about relationships. So you should be trustworthy to your audience and trustworthy to your business partners, and then you're more likely to be trusted, uh, and you're more likely to have people behave in a way where you would trust them. <laughs> you know, it's like, we gotta be good. Yeah. So, I, but I, I think, you know, go for it, and uh, try to focus on the communication and the community. Yeah. Um, bueno, lamentablemente tenemos la última pregunta del día, pero si tienen después más preguntas para hacer, pueden venir a, a hablar con Ben y Jessica, que van a estar acá afuera. They can come up and ask you questions, right? Okay. Um, bueno, uh, tenemos la última pregunta del día, por favor. Yeah. Hi. Hi. My question is, what is the best advice that someone given you, and how do you apply? when you have a problem in your daily work as a social media artist? I really like this one piece of advice we got from like a mentor and it was slow growth is real growth. And I think like the only, you know, movies you see about musicians are ones where all of a sudden, oh my gosh, they're playing for a million people and it's crazy. And like the, those are the stories you hear about. But I think that like everyone else, it's just like you're going along and you just I think you feel like what you're doing is not enough. And I think that the reality is when you're growing slowly, people like grow with you and um, see you through like your artistic journey, your artistic changes and appreciate like your life more and like kind of are more loyal than if they find out about you all at the same time and then forget about you all at the they same time, you know. New flavor. 
the celebrity arc, yeah. which is, wow, they're a new cool person. Oh, no. They're <laughs> very sad, and yeah. nobody's listening to them anymore. Yeah. 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 I think also remembering that we remember negative comments more than positive comments is yes. important. Always remember to read the and think about the positive stuff and try to build a habit. It's very hard to do, a habit of, of valuing the positive feedback, um, like, first and foremost. Th there's some negative feedback that is really constructive criticism, and that can be helpful, but it's not common in comments. Think about who is commenting constructive criticism. They don't, like, know you. They're just, they, they know you don't know them. So, like, what, where, that's a weird thing. So, in life, it's good to listen to criticism, but online, just try to focus on what nice things people are saying, and uh, the whole thing feels a little better. I get, every day, I get, like, four or five of the same comments of, like, what the hell, or why is this guy always writing about poop, or, like, um... <laughs> people be, like clearly not understanding what I'm talking about or even worse like they're just um, saying the same like joke that I've heard like a million times about my name or something so <laughs> it's you can get eventually a flood of like negativity but then there's the people who are like this made me laugh or I love this song and don't just like pass over them just remember oh yes that's right people listen to music they actually yeah. do <laughs> yeah Buenísimo. Bueno, muchas gracias por venir a escucharnos. Eh, y thank you, Ben and Jessica, for coming. Pido un aplauso, por favor. Bueno, muchas gracias. Thank you. Hemos finalizado nuestro encuentro en este momento. Pero, hey, no te quedes con toda la información. Compártela con el mundo en redes sociales utilizando el hashtag Col40. Y recuerda, esto es Colombia 4.0. Ya haces parte de la era de la inteligencia artificial.